Kira, everyone, uh, thank you for having me today. Um, and uh, so I will be talking about social media in the New Zealand 2023 election. Uh, and I will present some new results from the New Zealand social media study to you, which I'm running as the principal investigator. And before I show you the results, I will give you a little bit of background information on how we collect that data uh, and what the study is about, uh, because of course, uh, data doesn't fall from the sky and I'm not making it up. Uh, and so I think uh, I owe you a little bit uh, of background information on that first. So how did this project start? Um, so first of all, this started out of, a, of the context uh, of a European project. It's a comparative project. Um, and in 2019, ahead of the European elections, um, European social media scholars started to collect data on uh, Facebook. The German team also did Twitter additionally. And they were analyzing the campaigns of all parties um, in the countries which are participating in the European elections. Uh, and as you know, the European Parliament is in Strasbourg, and that's why they called the project campaigning for Strasbourg. And they had a comparable measurement across uh, all European countries um, so that they could compare the social media communication of the parties um, after that across countries. So they thought this was very successful. Um, and so in 2020, uh, they said we are extending that to national elections uh, and they invited me for New Zealand. Um, meanwhile, this is a project that analyzes um, uh, national elections in 17 countries. The first two for national elections who were to join were us in New Zealand as the New Zealand sub-project um, and the Israeli uh, project. Um, and now they call it DigiWorld. And so there is a certain core of the measurement instrument that I'm working with that is comparable across countries and elections. So we can look at that. And of course, there is also New Zealand specific stuff uh, in my uh, data um, uh, collection um, that we are specifically interested in here. And so this project was the New Zealand social media study and we ran it in the 2020 election for the first time. And since then, we are the only country in the world and the only sub project who runs it permanently also outside of election times. So that's me. that means I'm permanently studying um, the uh, social media communication of all parties and party leaders um, uh, in New Zealand, uh, also outside of election uh, times. Currently, no other country does that. For that purpose, we in 2022 founded the Internet Social Media and Politics Research Lab, of which I'm the director, and basically the New Zealand Social Media Study is it is its flagship study. But of course, we also do uh, other research uh, around social media politics and the internet. Um, and so, um, what are we doing in the New Zealand social media study? It's a partly computational and partly manual media content analysis of Facebook posts. Let me explain what that means. Um, so we are downloading with the help of CrowdTangle um, the posts of all parties and party leaders uh, outside of election times monthly. Um, and then we analyze it. Uh, CrowdTangle is a Facebook owned research company for which you can um, be accredited as a Facebook researcher when you apply for that. And so we download all of that data and uh, analyze it. Um, in election times, we go in weekly waves so that we are able to basically live report during the election. We are always just one week behind the election in our data analysis. So we download it. The coders get to analyze it. I run the statistical analysis and we usually put a blog post out on the university's website then. Um, the study has a longitudinal course, so that means on certain variables we collect data over all waves that we are thinking that we want to study over time that are particularly important for us. Um, on others, we are also able to, on short notice, basically add other variables to our codebook, let's say when the Freedom Convoy protests were here. Uh, in front of parliament, we added some variables on that to our code book to study that for a while. But of course, after that, we stopped that again. So we also have special topic waves. Um, and one month is always a wave. And in an election, one week is a wave. Um, and so what we also do, we allow buy-ins for external clients. Um, so uh, for example, Greenpeace was one of our external clients. Um, they wanted to know how the parties and the party leaders are thinking about the environment because they're always running against the same um, uh, kind of very strong attitudes they think with their communication. And so whenever my coders had said a post is about the environment or climate change, they also went through a set of five additional variables on behalf of Greenpeace, like let's say, does this post state uh, that the economy is more important than the environment? Does this post state that the environment is just for our personal enjoyment? So we do allow external clients to buy themselves uh, into the study. And we usually use uh, that money to reinvest into our research again. And 
enable me to run that study longer because of course you can imagine my student coders need to get paid <laughs> so they get an, uh, an uh, hourly loan for doing that the sample as i said before is parties and party leaders um, and we do all posts of them um, the manual part, so some variables we automatically um, do computational, so we can uh, get the number of comments, loves, likes, and ha-has on Facebook, we can get that automatically. Uh, we automatically know who the Facebook page owner is, what the date of the Facebook post was, so we don't have to do that stuff. But we have, of course, trained uh, student coders to analyze things like how negative is a post. So if you have a scale from very negative to somewhat negative to neutral to um, somewhat positive to very positive, um, they are basically rating that, and they have been trained on that for a long time using a codebook, which is a handbook with written instructions of how these concepts are defined. What do we mean by hate speech? What do we mean by fake news? What do we mean by a half-truth or negative campaigning? So that they just follow those rules in that codebook uh, and not apply just their subjective judgment, um, but kind of follow like little robots the rules uh, that we have uh, basically defined on uh, what that is. And of course, you can disagree with me on the definition because there is no right or wrong in the social sciences, but I have to be transparent. Of course, uh, that's why this is all uh, written down in a code book on how we define those concepts. And we can also measure how good they are in agreeing. So do they just apply their own um, subjective judgment or do they follow the rules that we have written down in that code book? For that, we usually run reliability tests, um, which check uh, how they agree. So if we have a reliability coefficient of 0.8 later, that means that in 80% of the cases, our coders would agree that what they are seeing here is fake news. Um, so that means there is a certain common meeting ground between them regarding that and that they are pro that we have achieved that common meeting ground because they are following the definition of that concept in the code book. Um, so, as I said, the interim results are published weekly in a blog on our website, uh, and um, uh, you can look that up in the news section. So who's currently in our sample? We have reduced it a little bit for the election because we are under a lot of time uh, pressure to go through that data in the election. So outside of election times, we analyze about a thousand posts per month. Um, currently, um, we had in the first two weeks, 1,555 posts. And you have to think about that the human coders have to go through that. And the code book is about 30 pages long. So they go through that and it takes them about six minutes to analyze one post. And those are currently the parties that are in our sample and their leaders, if the leaders have an active Facebook page. That, for example, is not the case in uh, case of Hannah Tamaki. She is just posting private stuff on her page. So we would just always code that as non-political. And so it's not very informative uh, for our purpose. That's why her leader page is not in there. Um, uh, the leader of the uh, NNP, for example, has a closed Facebook page. Uh, and so that's private and we respect that and we can't go get into that content. So we are not analyzing it either. And Leighton Baker is a case for whom we only have his personal page which at the same time is this party page, there is no separate party page. But for all of the others, basically it means we have a party page and a, a party leader page. So Labour would mean Hipkins and the Labour Party, uh, and also no subsections of the party. So um, what about the volume? How much are they posting in this election? Um, so we, uh, in the first week, actually had less uh, than we had in 2020. In the second week, uh, we now have uh, out uh, done 2020. So we have more than in 2020. Um, the party who posts three times as much as they did in 2020 is the ACT Party, and in particular, David Seymour. So they have really decided uh, that they want to run a very active social media campaign. Um, and so David Seymour apparently has um, uh, the ambition to become New Zealand's new social media powerhouse that in the post adern area. Um, so he is really on um, uh, Facebook uh, and very active there. Um, the other parties, National is doing more than Labour, um, uh, and the Green Party and the Murray Party uh, are posting less. But uh, usually uh, we also see a lot of uh, posts uh, and disproportionately high number from posts, given how they are doing in the polls. So most of them are polling under 1%. Uh, in particular of the fringe parties. 
Um, but one of the reasons why they are so active, like the New Zealand Outdoors and Freedoms Party um, on social media, is that they, of course, get less coverage and they have less news value uh, in the traditional media. And so this is their channel to reach out to their voters. Um, so it's not surprising that they post a lot of stuff uh, on Facebook and that actually from the New Zealand Outdoors and Freedom Party, we see most of the posts. But the number of their followers is also much lower than, of course, uh, in case of Labour or National. So um, the Labour Party, I think, currently has around 300k followers. Um, uh, the National Party has something around 150k. And the New Zealand Outdoors and Freedom Party, in comparison, only has 30k followers. So they also reach a much smaller audience um, with what they are posting. So what about the political topics um, they are posting uh, about? Um, not very surprising, the political scientists would say. It's mostly the economy. It's the economy stupid. Already Clinton's campaign manager in 1992 knew that. Um, so most of the social media communication is about the economy. That's rational um, uh, for the parties, uh, because um, this is also the topic that either ranks the highest among voters in surveys or is among the highest ranked uh, topics, usually. Um, this is very much also driven by the National Party. The National Party is focusing much more on the eco economy even than Labour is doing. Of course, makes sense because this pays off for them in a certain way. We are in a cost of living crisis um, and not accusing uh, the government uh, of being responsible uh, for that would be surprising if they are not doing that. Um, very often, um, the parties are also emphasizing, of course, what we call uh, competence issues. So issues they are associated with, associated with in the eyes of voters for being competent in handling them. For green parties, this is the environment. For labor parties all around the world, this is usually social issues. So this is, of course, issues that they um, emphasize a lot in their social media communication to make them become more salient. Um, and so um, we see labor, for example, also this is their second most important uh, issue, um, uh, highlighting labor uh, uh, and social issues. However, the economy is still number one for them because, first of all, it's the, the salient topic at the moment. Uh, and secondly, it seems to be that the National Party is driving the campaign agenda at the moment and that they are following. Um, we see other parties um, extremely high. For example, domestic policy is for ACT. Um, I think one of the reasons for this is uh, that National is not covering it as much. They are focusing more on the economy this time. And so they have left a little bit of a void for the ACT party uh, in the system. And a lot of this is around the treaty and co-governance um, uh, and their, in their opposition to that. Um, so what about how popular the candidates and the parties are on social media? Let's look at emoji reactions. Um, and don't make the mistake, some journalists make that. They always ask me if from that you can guess who's winning the election. You can't. <laughs> so um, first of all, only the people who like the parties follow them usually on social media. Of course, there's also journalists uh, among them uh, who follow that stuff. There is me who follows almost every party. So I always hope that not everyone thinks that I like some of them. <laughs> but. Uh, um, it's for professional reasons. Um, uh, but most of the people who do that, they actually follow them because they like them. Um, and so, uh, because this is kind of a version of a modern yard sign, uh, you, uh, in a certain way, expose yourself as a follower of that party if you do that. And that's why we see much less angry um, uh, and sad reactions uh, for, um, uh, for, for Luxon and Hipkins here. Uh, we see much more likes and loves. Um, so uh, Luxon seems to be a little, so his post seems to be a, a little more popular uh, with um, uh, the Facebook uh, followers uh, on his page uh, than uh, those of Chris Hepkins. But uh, apparently, if the Labour supporters like it, then they really like it and they directly love it. Um, but um, there is not that much uh, in terms of uh, how they will do in the election uh, that you can guess from that. We also found basically the same structure for Jacinda Ardern and Judith Collins in the last uh, election, also mostly positive reactions. Um, so uh, the same for Labour and the National Party, um, also a little bit more likes for, for the National Party, but uh, Labour supporters, uh, if they are in, they are really in, they love it. Um, so what about negative campaigning uh, in, in this election? Um, so we have heard very often um, that the parties have used this as a strategic move, of course, accusing each other of going dirty. Um, so um, uh, the, the National Party said that uh, Labour is running the most negative campaign of all times. 
um, and that there would be very personal attacks against Christopher Luxon. Uh, on the other hand, Labour said that's not true. Uh, there are a lot of attack acts, uh, acts against us uh, and they are very thin skinned uh, and it's actually worse what we are getting. Um, but that's a strategic move. Uh, so they, they are both going negative, of course, um, but I will show you in a second that overall it's still uh, more posit uh, positivity. Um, so let's answer the question that Chris Bishop has raised, has um, uh, be kind, uh, become be nasty on social media. So here we have uh, the percentage um, of positive, less negative posts for the Labour Party and the National Party. So if we, um, from the positive posts, subtract the negative posts, and a post can be both or it can be neither, we get the net positivity. So how much positivity uh, is left there? Uh, and actually, it seems like the Labour Party, 63% uh, um, uh, of their communication uh, is net positive whereas the National Party, only 5.5% of their social media communication um, is net positive. I you look all shocked, I'm not, um, because I would be shocked if it would be the other way around. So the National Party is the challenger party here, um, and the uh, Labour Party is the incumbent, and what does an incumbent do? Defend their record. So they campaign on a positive uh, achievement. They like to say to people, look, this is what we achieved. Give us three more years. So this is a typical incumbent style of campaigning. Um, challenger parties, they would not do their job if they would not be attacking a government. Uh, and that is also uh, a core task of democratic campaigning. Um, to actually hold the incumbent accountable uh, for stuff. Um, and so National is actually really doing their job here. So this is this is negative campaigning, but not necessarily a negative picture uh, for them. So um, it might uh, tell us that the accusation that Labour is going harder against them is not correct, but it tells us that they are doing their job as a challenger party and as the opposition, they are attacking Labour in a pretty fierce uh, uh, campaign. Um, and uh, so this is what we are seeing here, and it's a picture that you see in elections all around the world. So this would not be different for, for any other election. Um, so what about Hipkins versus Luxon? There, it's not as pronounced the difference between the two, but it's the same, uh, still the same pattern. So Hipkins is more positive and Luxon uh, is attacking more uh, in the end. Um, but why is the difference not as pronounced um, as for uh, the parties? Um, so also a pattern that we see all around the world is that um, high profile people, uh, ministers and others, they leave it to their parties, the party leaders to attack and they're not doing it themselves in case because there's always a certain risk that stuff can backfire. So you leave it to the um, basically lower ranked people and to the parties. In the US, they very often like to outsource the negative campaigning to the political action committees, the PACs. So they run the most negative ads. And so it's clear that Christopher Luxon should uh, stay free of any kind of stains in that campaign um, in case something would backfire in attack. So they leave it more to the party to attack uh, and less uh, to him. Um, so what about the main targets? Uh, pretty rational. So National runs a very rational attack campaign here. So their targets are, of course, Labour, Hipkins and the New Zealand government. Um, so this is a challenger party going against uh, an uh, incumbent. But of course, also the Mari and the Green Party's potential coalition partners uh, get attacked. Um, and then there is a, a certain amount of random others after that it fizzles out. Um, what about the Labour Party? Um, so there we have, again, National and Luxon being attacked. Makes sense. Uh, this is their, uh, their co direct competitor. But also, it's not as rational as the uh, National Party's attack strategy, so it's not such a clear attack strategy. There's also a random amount of other people um, uh, that get attacked uh, in their negative uh, posts. So what are the policy areas? Where's the battleground? It's the economy, stupid again. Um, and so they mostly attack each other on the field of the economy, a little bit on domestic policies and transport and infrastructure. Um, but the main battleground uh, in this election is the economy. Um, so this is where most of the negative posts are. Um, same for the Labour Party. Um, and so this is also, uh, they attack mostly in the field of the economy. This might pay off for national more uh, in, in, in a certain way, if uh, because this is the topic that usually center-right parties are associated with as being competent in the eyes of the voters. For the Labour Party, it would be much more, uh, much better if Labour and Social 
uh, would be the salient topic, um, and this would be the battleground uh, in this election. However, negative campaigning is not necessarily bad if you want to ask that. So are they doing democracy a disfavor? There is something called the demobilization hypothesis um, in uh, political communication research. Uh, so for a long time, we thought negative campaigning might affect turnout negatively and people would not turn out. Um, overall, there is inconclusive research results on that, and that could not be confirmed in a meta-analysis of all studies, uh, that overall there is less evidence for the demobilization hypothesis. Um, so some studies found that it leads to mobilization, others found uh, that it uh, leads uh, to demobilization, can still be demobilizing for, for subgroups. Uh, this morning, for example, I had a conversation with someone from a Mari radio station who says that Mari feel very um, uh, basically demobilized uh, uh, and um, tune out of politics um, uh, if a lot of the fake news are around and the negative campaigning are around race-based issues, um, which I totally get. Um, so this can still be the group, uh, case for subgroups that this is affecting them more than others. Um, so, um, but American research has shown actually that the biggest problem is when the negative posts outweigh the positive posts. Um, so if we look at the net positivity again and from the positive posts subtract the negative posts, um, then uh, what do we get overall? So what's the level of posi uh, positivity across all parties? Um, it is pretty good. It would be bad if I would that line would be below zero. That would mean that negative posts would outweigh positive posts. Um, but that is not the case overall. We see across all parties that still the positivity is outweighing uh, the negativity. Um, and that means there might not be a demobilizing effect on turnout uh, in, in that case. Um, uh, and so this is even dragged down by some of the smaller parties who show more negative um, uh, uh, campaign communication. So the topic that everyone is always interested in the most uh, is how much bis and misinformation there's an end missing. <laughs> uh, do we see on social media, you always spot the typos once they are in front of you on the slides, <laughs> or when you have submitted something to a conference, uh, of course you see the typos after that. Uh, that's the best way to find them. Um, so uh, this is still the beginning of the campaign. That can still change over the course of the campaign. Um, so we have measured fake news and half-truth. Um, so um, fake news are fully made up and intentionally and verifiably false stories uh, when something is really fully made up a post. Um, and we have measured half-truth because we already in 2020 figured out that the New Zealand parties are very often flying under the radar of these full-fledged fake news that we have seen for the US and other countries. There is very often posts where everything is correct, just once detail is a little bit dodgy, over-interpreted, highly selectively chosen, and not fully correct. So this is bending the truth, as I would say, but not full fake news. So I'll show you the results on that in a second. Um, so that's why also the half-truth are higher, because also the established parties are engaging in bending the truth now and then. Um, but the real fake news are not as high. I was very worried ahead of that election, because in 2020, we did not find much fake news. Of over 3,000 posts we analyzed in the last four weeks before the election, less than 20 were fake news, and less than 75 were half-truth. So that was 2.5% back then. But as I told you before, um, I'm analyzing this constantly, so we monitor that over time. And shortly before the election, in around June, we were at 6%. And so I was wondering how this would look like in the election, but this is not the full picture for the full election yet, because of course we are not uh, there yet, so we are still in the data analysis. But currently we are standing um, at not that much Facebook, like 2.5%, so it's not too bad, and uh, more half-truth, of course. And let's look at who's spreading that stuff. Um, so in the in the first uh, um, uh, part of the election that we have analyzed, um, we find this mostly for the part parties under the Freedom uh, Coalition's uh, umbrella. Um, and it's very much driven by the New Zealand Outdoors uh, and Freedom Party, uh, also by Vision New Zealand. Um, there are a few that might still kind of join that club, like NZ Loyal, because we have seen them in our data before. Uh, spreading a lot of that stuff. Uh, not so much uh, in the first part of this campaign now. I guess they were a little bit busy with mourning that they had forgotten to um, uh, register candidates. Um, so then with spreading fake news. What do I mean by fake news? Here's an example. Um, so uh, Sue Gray, the leader of the New Zealand Outers and Freedoms Party, for example, has spread the litter box hoax that you might have heard about. 
um, that is claiming that uh, kids in schools demanded litter boxes um, because they identified as cats or furries. And this is how far the transgender thing and all the pronoun thing would go these days. So actually, this is a hidden attack against transgender people. And it has been debunked several times, and that hoax has been spreading from the UK. But Sue Gray has raised it here, and it has even uh, gotten a poor principal of a New Zealand school uh, suddenly into the middle of a media frenzy because he was accused by them of having litter boxes in his classroom. And he said, like, no, we don't have any. But uh, this is the kind of stuff that we code under fake news. We reserve that for very severe cases because we acknowledge freedom of speech. Um, and so we do not lightly, um, because who am I to decide what the truth is? But there are still, I think, facts where we can say this is simply uh, false information. So we reserve it uh, to that. And we have um, voluntarily chosen to rather under than overestimate fake news. Um, so what about full-fledged conspiracy theories? How much of that stuff is full-fledged conspiracy theories? It's the same suspects um, who are posting full-fledged conspiracy theories. Um, over the course in between the elections, we have also seen a bit from New Zealand First uh, on conspiracy theories. Currently not. We will see if that changes when we have fully analyzed the data. Um, so what do I mean by conspiracy theories? I give you a little bit of a taste again uh, on what I mean by that. Oh. Play. Where's the cursor? All right, so why is that conspiracy theory? Um, for the simple reason, oops, um, that um, uh, basically they are addressing some undefined globalists here um, and uh, are not kind of telling us who these globalists are. They are very much um, against the UN since the um, uh, local elections already and are spreading that basically the UN is secretly ruling New Zealand. Um, and of course, uh, it's not like that money from ordinary New Zealanders goes in any two kind of undefined globalist bank accounts. Um, so um, what are the targeted groups by the disinformation uh, posts? So I not mean their targets, but the ones that they are reaching out to, that they are explicitly addressing, that they are trying to be appealing to. So the audience they try to be appealing to uh, is very much uh, vaccine skeptic. It's the former Freedom Convoy protesters, and it's very conservative uh, voters. Um, so they try to actually reconnect to the height of their movement, which were the Freedom Convoy protests in front of parliament, and try to get those people to turn out with, I think, doubtful success at the moment because they are not doing that well in the polls. And of course, conservative voters buy their uh, stuff. So let me um, uh, close only three more slides, then I'm done, uh, and Ellie uh, can take over uh, with half-truth um, and why this is higher. We also see this uh, from established parties all across the political spectrum, usually. So we have found that all across the political spectrum in our data before. In the first part of the campaign, we have found it for some half-truth for national and act uh, and their leaders, but don't overestimate that. Behind that are not many incidents, actually, so the N is low. So this is like four or six incidents where we have found something that was not fully correct in their post, but most of it was right. And to give you an example again by what uh, this would be um, uh, coded, so for example, here we have David Seymour stating that former communist countries uh, are now um, uh, richer, that we felt sorry for, are now richer than New Zealand. Uh, and he points out Lithuania there. So first of all, this OECD data is not the latest OECD data. Um, there is a uh, newer OECD data. Second, this is a highly selected indicator. And the GDP per work hour is actually an indicator of labor productivity and not an indicator of the wealth of a country. New Zealand is still more wealthy than all of the former communist countries. And it's also still much closer uh, to the US and Australia in the ranking of uh, wealth uh, of countries. Um, so this is kind of a, a misleading interpretation of a factor of labor productivity. On the other hand, the National Party here has one. Um, where it's correct that the Ministry for Pacific People has spent that amount of money on certain breakfasts for stakeholders in the Pacific community. So that's all fully correct. 
Um, but they are suggesting basically that it's a campaign event, which was which had the purpose to promote Labour um, uh, MPs. It was a standard ministry uh, events, and the Pacific Caucus of the Labour Party was one of the stakeholders who was co-inviting. So there was actually um, uh, no reason to say uh, that uh, or uh, to suggest to people that this was an event to promote uh, MPs of the Labour Party. So these would be half truth. Most of it is right, uh, but something is not accurate. Um, of course, this is still higher so um, uh, for the parties outside of parliament than for the parties inside of parliament. Um, and that's it from my side. You can follow us on Twitter if you're interested in the results from this study. Um, and uh, also we have uh, two uh, of our blog posts out already that you find under news on Victoria University's webpage. And there are two more following one before the election still next Thursday and one after the election, which is basically an overview. That's it from my side. I am in computer science, and the first kind of weird thing is that there should even be a computer scientist talking about sort of political currents of opinion uh, leading up to an election. It's a weird thing, but these days technology is quite influential in the way that information is spread around the world, and that's why I'm here, I guess. So uh, I, I'm interested in, in this general question, and I've been asked to talk specifically about the New Zealand election that, that we're in the middle of right now, so I'll try and do that. So there's two systems that I'll talk about. Um, one of them is social media recommender systems, uh, which is like the way social media runs basically is driven by uh, technology, is driven by AI, is driven by machine learning. And I'm gonna go into some of the trends that, that uh, we know something about, although we don't know all the details, um, that seem to have an influence on, on the way that information spreads around on social media that are driven by technology. Uh, so, yeah, the idea is that the, 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 the technology that runs social media platforms has some sort of influence uh, on political communication and on cultural uh, sort of opinions and on public opinion and political opinion. Um, and those might have an indirect influence on the New Zealand election through the influence that they have on public opinion, which leads to people to support one party or another, I suppose, ultimately. Um, the other thing I'll talk about, uh, which is the thing that people mostly think about when they think of AI in relation to political communication and political currents of opinion, is these new things that arise that, that, that have been here for a couple of years called generative AI systems. So, for instance, ChatGPT is the one that most people have heard about, uh, and they can have more of a direct influence. But the short message is that we haven't seen very much of, of that kind of thing in, uh, in the current election. So... Social media is where I'll start. Um, I won't take too long about this, so I've got time for questions. So most Kiwis are social media users and get at least some of their news content from social media. Uh, people spend lot, people who do use social media spend large amounts of time on it. I think two and a half hours per day on average is about the, the right number for New Zealand, but I, I might be remembering it wrong. Um, I thought that maybe Mona would have a better number, so I didn't put a specific number from one I found. It's quite difficult to find uh, reliable statistics on this. Um, I, but the point I want to sort of emphasize is that social media platforms really run on AI because when you're a user of social media and you get a feed of content, for instance, a news feed on Facebook or something like that, the thing that decides what order you see items in, what comes first, what's ranked as the most important thing for you to see is decided by a machine learning algorithm. Uh, it's decided automatically that, you know, everyone has different feeds. And the reason why is partly because they have different friends and, and subscribe to different things, but partly because there's a system that's looking at what they're doing and monitoring what they're doing, working out what they like, what every individual person likes, and then trying to give them more of the same, right? So let me just uh, flesh that out. Uh, so, a recommend so the thing that does that is called a recommender system. It's a pure machine learning system. It's pure AI. And that's the kind of the, the petrol which makes recommenders, which makes social media platforms so popular. They can customize content to you and you and you, and that's why people like to use them, I guess. So what it does, it monitors your, your behavior and your behavior. Let's just pick one person. Let's say it's me. So it watches what I'm doing, watches what I like, watches how long I watch certain videos, uh, how often I hover my, my mouse over some particular image, uh, uh, how often I comment on something or repost it. All of those things are engagement. It, it sort of picks up on those things and learns not about individual pieces of content, but types of content. So the social media recommender algorithm learning uh, device goes away and groups users into types of user and groups content into types of content. And this is, ah, that sort of person likes that sort of thing. And then it works out on that basis 
what to give you next. Uh, and that, and so it can prioritize things in your news feed uh, and a feed about who you might like to follow and all sorts of feeds. So social media uh, algorithms have many feeds. So that would be okay, but for the fact that there are some interesting kind of well-documented and slightly dodgy cognitive biases that you might imagine push the recommender algorithm to learn something about you, which you might not necessarily want it to learn, or you might not expect to be it to be learning. And I'll just mention a few of those. Um, so here's one that's relevant to politics, and I don't know how this connects with what Mona was saying, but political content that contains high moral emotions, whether they're positive or negative, actually, people like that. People click on it, people disseminate it, people forward it, people comment on it. It's more engaging, and that stuff travels faster than other stuff. It's kind of interesting. This is, you know, data from a couple of years ago. It's very, very well established, pre-registered studies, good, good empirical stuff. Here's another one, also very interesting. More, I think by the same group, actually. Um, anything which is about the others politically, you know, like them or something, whether it's positive or negative, actually, it goes both ways. People like to click on that. People like to look at it. They like to, to share it. It travels faster. Okay, why, why are these things true? This is just... This is cognitive science, right? These are cognitive biases. There are certain things that get us going and that make us want to uh, engage with certain sorts of content. But you might imagine that there are slightly worrying consequences of this for the overall ecosystem. Here's another one. False stuff travels faster than true stuff. This is a bit older, but it's pretty well established, I think. And why is that? Maybe false stuff is surprising. You know, be like, what the hell? And so you click on it. But the recommender algorithm doesn't know that you're clicking on it because you're thinking, what the hell? It just thinks, ah, user A likes content B. And so they give you more of that. And then you might start to get used to it. Who knows? So I'm being a bit, you know, there's a cause for concern here. I'm, I'm trying to sort of elaborate for you. Um, if recommender algorithms learn from these cognitive biases, they might progressively push users in certain directions, which might not be very good. And you know, you might explain some currents of political opinion like that. Now, I don't want to go overboard on this because we just don't know if this is true or not. We don't know, we should know, and the only way of really knowing is to get inside companies uh, to find out uh, from the inside because they have the best methods by far of doing this, but we don't yet have access. However, it's been a new law passed in the EU. You may have heard about it, the Digital Services Act, um, and it's specifically a regulation about social media. It has specific obligations on the large companies and the uh, uh, the, the legislature. Sorry, the um, uh, the regulators uh, in the EU under this uh, Digital Services Act are going to have a lot of power to audit companies and find out answers to the sort of questions that are raised here. So we'll know more soon. We don't know it yet. But I just mention all this because it's a, it's a potential influence on uh, the dynamics of, of, of discussions in politics at the moment. And we've heard from, from Mona about what the, uh, the party people are saying, but we don't know what everyone else is saying. That's not, not part of your analysis. And so you just might imagine what might be happening, but we need to know more is the basic thing here. Regular uh, Policymakers don't know enough about, about this yet. People who are like, looking after the, the, the health of elections don't know enough about this. And, and hopefully the EU will provide us uh, more answers. And, when, and our group uh, uh, is, is, is uh, at the Global Partnership for AI is, is, uh, is working with the EU regulators to do this. So that's all I wanted to say about generative AI tools, uh, sorry, about uh, social media stuff. It's like, that's a concern that we need to know more about, and we will hopefully find out more uh, through the, the EU regulation that's in place. Second thing I want to talk about is generative AI tools. So this is things like, um, this is this is a new concern this this time around that we didn't have last. And I think that's why lots of people have been asking about this. It, it, we didn't have ChatGPT last year. We didn't have MidJourney last year. But just to give you an example, so a text generator like ChatGPT, uh, GPD, which is very available to people, many people have tried it out. You can get it to produce texts that kind of like that present this information or that present libelous kind of like scandalous content about people and you can make them look very good because it writes very well and so it can seem to be something that you'd find in a newspaper for instance um so there, there are guardrails that you have to get over but there are lots of jailbreaks that people can quite readily learn about that allow people to generate quite scurrilous stuff awful stuff sometimes actually um, if, if they put a bit of work in. And certainly the bar for producing disinformation um, is much lower than it used to be, both in terms of the amount of, of uh, content you can create and also in terms of the quality. You don't need to be a good writer anymore in order to generate content uh, which is quite high level. 
It's the same with image generators. So, for instance, Midjourney is, is a well-known one. You can type in something saying, you know, I'd like, you know, a picture of Ali dressed in a clown suit or a picture of, I don't know, Donald Trump dressed in a clown suit or something, and bang, you get it, no problem. And so that is also a, a vehicle, for, a new vehicle this, this time round, this, this election round for disinformation. That's specifically to do with images. So there have been many concerns, including in New Zealand, but around the world, basically, that democracies are going to be destabilized by the new abilities that there are to create disinformation at industrial scales with, with tools like these. Um, I would say in New Zealand election, there hasn't been too much on this. And just, I mean, uh, I haven't got chapter and verse, but I did talk just yesterday to a, a journalist who had done a bit more kind of uh, research on this, who talked to the Electoral Commission, who talked to the ASA and the BSA, and there was only one concern out of all that that was raised. And so I think that's a reasonable sign, of course. How would we know, right? How would we know? You know, when you see a thing, when you see something on social media, how do you know whether it was written by a machine or a person? Because the thing's quite good at generating text now and quite convincing. And I'll get to that at the end. That's the point I'll finish on. I will talk about the one concern that, that you might have come across if you've uh, been looking at the news. So there was a little while ago, back in May, a uh, uh, story uh, uh, from One News that, uh, that National had used an AI image generator mid-journey, that thing I was talking about, to produce some of its ads, and this is one of the examples. So this is something that was produced. It's a picture of uh, Pacific uh, healthcare workers um, that was generated by a machine, not by a, not by a person. These aren't real people. So uh, is that okay? Um, here's another one. There was a few of them. So here's another one. New Zealand is not. So this is, I think you would, what Mona would call an attack ad. Would that be an attack ad or... Yeah, that would be yeah, so uh, very much appealing to God, there's going to be more crime and something like that. So that's another one. Um, and here's another one. That's another real one. The interesting thing is because this was done on mid journey and mid journey, uh, if you're using it, you have to use this other social media thing actually called Twitch and produce the images on that and everyone can see them. And so the, the investigative journalist from One News who, 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 uh, who uh, reported this stuff also found the user who was creating these ads for the National Party. And actually, the National Party didn't originally know about it. But it's interesting to see some of the kind of attempts, which were also a story in, in one news, about that, that were created. I, I don't think we have the prompts here that we use to generate these texts. But here are some rejected images. So these are images that the, the person who was creating these ads by machine was generating. He said, actually, we won't use that one. We won't use that one. They're a bit weird or something like that. Or here's a slightly weird, but a bit too over the top. Let's not use that one. Here's another one that was rejected for some reason. Here's a great one. Every so often, Mid Journey just kind of spits the dummy and gives you something weird. Um, and you can sort of look at this and you could sort of trace the creative process by which these pictures were made uh, and sort of refine and stuff, which is what you do. Um, Luxon uh, had no idea that this was going on. Uh, actually, he denied that it had been used to start with because it was like something you wouldn't expect, I suppose. And it's completely new, all this stuff. Um, a, a national spokesperson acknowledged that they had used AI to create stock images. And I think the issue here is that all they're doing is, you know, shortcutting the process of going away and finding models and taking photographs uh, or creating imagery. So like it's, they're, they're saving money and it was probably just one particular contractor in the uh, marketing department who was doing this stuff. Um, so uh, the, 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 um, the, 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 the National Party uh, spokesman said it's an innovative, innovative way to drive our social media. So there was a little bit of a sort of attempt to justify this. Um, but they did want to use it responsibly. Uh, if they're using it responsibly, they should have said that it was AI generated, I think. Um, uh, Luxon actually has a sort of positive story about this at one point because they wanted to sort of present themselves as the party that were sort of like the most adept at technology and the most uh, sort of like on, on, on board with current affairs and uh, current, current technology. Um, Anyway, there's a broader step here I just want to briefly mention before we go to questions, which is that AI can do more, so it can produce video content as well. You can have fake video footage, footage of politicians saying things, put words into the mouth of politicians and have them say things. That might be potentially worrying and potentially very kind of concrete uh, piece of disinformation. We haven't seen any of that. All we saw were these static images, which really are, are a small, you know, a small thing in relation to what would be possible. Um, and we haven't seen any fake um, newspaper reports or any fa fake textual reports. But again, how would we know? But we don't think there are any. We think that if there had been some, someone would have noticed it. Um, 
Here's the thing that I think is an interesting one. So if you're on social media and you have the ability to uh, degenerate content and you have the ability to target messages at particular demographics or particular groups of people, uh, then by combining those two things, you have really something quite powerful in the area of misinformation, which we're not seeing yet, but you could see this. And so I'm thinking like, for instance, uh, AI enhanced social media targeting for politics, that's something that came up in, in, in Cambridge Analytica a few years ago. That was in 2013 when a company gathered personality information from Facebook users and then targeted political messages at voters based on their personality. If they had high degrees of introversion, then you'd show them this. If they had high degrees of uh, openness to new experiences, you would give them this and so on. So that's... Uh, you know, okay, potentially just targeting. But if you're targeting ads and also generating misinformation, you can target misinformation to people in very subtle ways, um, which might be very destabilizing, I think. But we haven't seen any of that. Uh, yeah. But if it was delivered on social media, it would be hard to detect. I think that's the interesting thing because um, social media uh, messages that go out to ordinary citizens are not easy to monitor, monitor even for people like Mona, who's, who's able to monitor publicly available news feeds. But going below the radar to individuals and targeting individuals, that's a lot harder and more of a worry. So that's what I want to finish with. Uh, it's, it's this sort of general question, again, just a very general uh, one. In this election, we don't think so, uh, that, that AI generators have, have been at all uh, uh, destabilizing. But we need to be serious about this issue going forward. And, and one thing you could do, I don't think you should, is to, it is to uh, ban the use of AI content generation in elections. But you could also require disclosure of AI-generated content. And that would be a more sensible position to take. Uh, the recent review of New Zealand electoral law, which just came out in June, didn't mention anything about that. That might have been a missed opportunity. Um, but in any case, how would you enforce a rule like this? And we've done a little bit of work, which, which I'll finish with, which is about how you can ensure some transparency about AI-generated content. So this, again, comes from uh, this group that I, I'm part of, the Global Partnership on AI. I, I lead a responsible AI uh, project in there, which is specifically on social media. So uh, we're thinking about recommender algorithms and harms and contact classifiers and stuff like that. But we also have a, a suggestion about generative AI safety. And that is, in a nutshell, that we need reliable tools for detecting AI-generated content. What we want is something which an ordinary citizen could use or a social media company could use, incidentally, to take any piece of content that they see and just ask, did it come from a machine or a person or some mixture of those two? We would like that automated tool to be available um, it's actually very hard to build that tool. There are many tools out there that claim to be able to do that at the minute, but they don't really work. And, and our, uh, our suggestion, our proposal is that the only way of making them re work reliably is to get the companies that make the generators to instrument their generators to support um, detection uh, of the content that their stuff produces. Um, so our, our, our view is that responsibility falls on the companies uh, making the generators for building detectors that can detect the content that those generators produce. So in, in, uh, in, uh, in a nutshell, here's what we suggest. A company that that's develops a new generative AI system should be required by law to demonstrate a reliable detection mechanism for the content that that uh, uh, system generates as a condition of that system's public release. Uh, and if you can't produce that reliable detector uh, and make it available to the public, then you shouldn't release your model because it's not safe, it's not transparent. So that's had uh, some traction, actually. So we've had quite famous AI people um, uh, uh, support this and co-author the, the papers that we've written. Uh, and it's sort of been incorporated by the EU Parliament in its amendments to the AI Act that go specifically to um, uh, generative AI. And it's actually been talked about in the US Senate as well quite recently. Again, our co-authors were uh, asked to give evidence here, in here in a, in, a, in, a, in a Senate hearing, which is a bit like the movie Oppenheimer, where there's these senators who are saying, asking about them, you know, some new technology and getting the scientists to tell them about it and say whether it's safe or not. So I, I think I'll finish there. Um, there are some references to that stuff if anyone's interested.